conference in this series of exploring the ideals of true love and world peace and also we'll be examining the issues of uh, love, relationships, character, family, many important issues and these will be discussed 
uh, by students and by professors uh, by both uh, sides during these next two days. My name is Tony Devine. I'm the Vice President of the International Educational Foundation, and I'll be uh, your co-moderator uh, during these next two days. Um, I would like now to extend a very, very warm welcome to all of our participants and delegates who have come throughout Russia, from throughout China, and from throughout the United States. So how about if each delegation could give a welcoming applause to the other two delegations, uh, just to get everyone properly welcomed uh, here this morning. So especially uh, for our American and for our Chinese delegations and also for those people who came from other parts of Russia, I hope that you got a small taste of Russian culture uh, during the past day or even two days uh, during your va various visits uh, around Moscow and uh, in, in the neighboring region. Up to now, we have been together uh, country by country uh, you know, staying in, in hotels country by country. So this is the first opportunity uh, where we can get together from all three countries. So at this, during uh, the conference itself, we are seated by country again. And uh, even though this was not our desire, we wanted everyone to be completely mingled in this hall here, but there's two practical reasons why we are together country by country. Uh, the main reason, of course, is to facilitate discussion because, uh, because we just don't speak the other two languages. So this is the main practical reason. Another reason is that some of the presentations will have uh, visuals in all three languages. So you're sitting corresponding uh, to your screen in English, in Chinese, uh, in, and in Russian. But beyond this, beyond this uh, formality here, we really want you to take the maximum advantage of all of the breaks, of the meal times, all of today and all of tomorrow, to really extend yourselves and make those new contacts from the other two countries. And in fact, you know, one of the uh, uh, highlights of a conference like this is the opportunity to actually meet people from other countries and to learn about those cultures, learn about those people, and to make new friends, new colleagues, uh, you know, that you can follow up with afterwards. And uh, toward this end, I just want to give everyone a goal, actually, because sometimes we get so caught up in the proceedings, we forget this aspect. So everyone's goal, at least one goal for the conference, is that everyone leaves on Monday or Tuesday with 10 new friends. And that three of those, at least three of those, should be from one of the other two countries. So how about that? You think that's an achievable goal? Yeah. Let's do this. And uh, this will have further meaning tomorrow afternoon because we're going to have a friendship ceremony where we're actually going to uh, formally come together as the three countries and, and create a lifetime friend, uh, lifetime friendships in a very special event tomorrow afternoon. So to prepare for that, uh, work hard in creating those new friends today and tomorrow. So to get started with this process, at this point in time, why don't you now turn to the person to the right of you, to the left of you, behind you, in front of you, and extend a greeting and uh, introduce yourself. So let's do that right now throughout the auditorium. <laughs>
back everyone. May I have your attention? Before we begin with the uh, opening address, I just want to draw your attention uh, to what's in your bags. So in your bag, you have the, uh, we have the, con the conference materials. And one of those materials... писателя 17 века Ивана Форостинина, который говорил, совершенствовать душу и направлять мысли юного долг истинного учителя. Мне кажется, что эти замечательные слова могли бы стать девизом нашей конференции. Да, только духовно богатый, честный, добрый человек может по благо использовать может по благо использовать полученные знания. Поэтому воспитание нравственного человека – это первая задача и первая основа. Как это сделать? Какую роль здесь играет семья, общество, государство? На эти вопросы, я думаю, даст ответ конференции. Поиск любви, смысла жизни, родственной души, понимания – то есть все то, что отличает человека от других живых существ, но это и определяет сложный и порой трагический путь. На этом пути молодого человека ждут разные опасности, в том числе и пьянство, и суицид, и многие-многие другие. Хотелось бы, чтобы на конференции были затронуты, были затронуты вопросы не только нравственного, но и физического здоровья. Ведь не случайно говорят, что в здоровом теле здоровый дух. Я очень рада, что сейчас в России появляется новая и старая как мир наука. Наука валиология, наука о здоровье, здоровом образе жизни. Я думаю, что со временем она может потеснить медицину, науку о недугах. Здоровое общество, здоровая семья, здоровая молодежь, здоровые дети – вот тот идеал, к которому мы стремимся. И опять же хотелось бы получить ответы на этой конференции на совершенно правильно и очень актуально поставленные вопросы. Человек – существо социальное, и образование также – основа основ его судьбы в окружающем мире. Мне довелось принимать участие в одной очень важной конференции, тема которой звучала так. В политике любого государства, и в первую очередь, конечно, моей любимой России, я хочу обратиться, я хочу призвать участники конференции, помогите мне внимание, желаю терпения и уважения, ума станет таким добрым учителем, наставником, для всех нас. Спасибо вам за внимание. Republic of China, 
Russia, and the United States. Probably this is the first gathering of its kind, size, and scope to be held in Russia in the new millennium. You are all truly You are all truly history makers. And I congratulate you for your participation. This gathering is unique and significant from many points of view. Just a century or two ago, such a meeting would be next to impossible. If you started here in Moscow and traveled for an entire day, you might cover a few kilometers on horseback. Today, however, you have breakfast in Moscow, lunch in Beijing, dinner in New York, and be back in Russia by the following morning. Or simply turn on your television or computer and technology will link you with the entire planet instantly. We are indeed a global village and share a common destiny. This is much more than a simple point. Travel, travel and technology was once a privilege of wealth of adventurous few. Now, increasingly millennium, the Cold War which dominated the last half of the century is no more. But while tensions between the major powers have decreased and an atmosphere of global cooperation between rich and poor and the increasing moral confusion, these are more than mere economic or political issues. They point toward a crisis in your values, common values, and global perspectives as our program is titled is essential, must be found in our humanity, more than our respect for elders, service to community. Most developed countries, the number of the married couples which are increasing. According to me, three children born in America, in Thailand, of a father in their increasingly accepted. As a result, the, the number of medically identifiable sexually transmitted disease has increased from three types in the 1960s to nearly 16,000 people come share the HIV every day. That equals one infection every five seconds. In some areas of the world, it is infects expected that AIDS will kill one half of the young generation. Undeniably, the crisis is one of global proportions and requires cooperative global solutions. In the process, as we consider the widespread and rapid increase, smoking cigarettes, drinking alcohol, taking drugs, engaging a fire, the jet planes that brought us here, the translation equipment that allows us to communicate, and the rapid development in technology and in perception, practical, practical, that the 21st century be one of peace, prosperity, and happiness, and so past, present, and future meet here national conference. I truly believe that each of you will determine what you gain from this meeting for your success. Thank you very much. So educators, community leaders, and youth. He has helped to organize programs and seminars for thousands of administrators, school directors, and teachers in the Commonwealth of Independent States. A trip over the
in Moscow, great country of Russia. On behalf of the conference founders, Dr. and Mrs. Sun Young Moon, I'd like to extend heartfelt greeting to all of you. I truly appreciate that you took the time from your busy schedules and traveled such a long way to be part of this very critical meeting. Based upon Dr. Moon's vision and his teaching, I'd like to speak about the importance of cultivating heart and character as the basis of lasting love and of creating happy, healthy families. We are living in an age of profound change, driven by incredible advances in science and technology. These changes are sweeping over the face of the earth, transforming cultures and upsetting ancient traditions and customs. In the face of such an events, old traditions and values often seem powerless to respond to the problem that often accompany these changes. These problems include the now nearly all the trend for the sexual immorality, the rise of divorce, and the consequence breakdown of families, increasing crime, violence, drug, and alcohol abuse and rampant environmental problems. Although previously these problems afflicted Western societies in particular, they are rapidly infiltrating all cultures, and no nation can consider itself immune from these negative influences. At the root of all these problems are selfish individuals and their desire for instant gratification. People advocate moral relativism where all values are considered to be subjective, relative, and arbitrary, and there is no absolute standard of right this unspoken and often unconscious view of life is what fuels much of the destructive behavior that we see in our world today. Without a sense of shared values, which are absolute and unchangeable, human society quickly fragments as individuals and groups pursue their own self-centered interests and desires. It is well documented that the greatest youth and social problems occur where the family structure is broken down. Conversely, where families are strong and stable, there are fewer social problems. Thus, healthy families are the foundation of a healthy society. The family is the first school of love, for it is here that a young person learns the essential values and virtues that form the foundation for achieving his or her goals in life. For example, when a child receives educated love and guidance from parents, that child is much less likely to become transmissious and get involved with other high-risk activities. Uh, my speech is one of key note areas, a little bit rather long, so in order to save my time, if you agree, I'd like to summarize my presentation and I'll make a conclusion. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. But please don't forget to read. My speech is very thorough, absolutely. In the airplane. It's a very important conversation. So, next session, cultivating heart and character. 
I envision uh, three purposes of our life. First is the, to become the man or woman of a good character. That is our first goal in our life. So translator has a good uh, translation session of the women in the text. <coughs> Clearly. Uh, then second goal is to, uh, to create healthy, beautiful, stable family. Then involve very healthy human relationships. Then third life goal is to uh, use our creative ability and subjugate environment, also cultivate environment. Then we can create a uh, prosperous society and making substantial contributions to the society, nation, and even eventually to the world. That is our life, third life goal. In accordance, in accordance to those life goals, what is the goal of education? The first dimension of education must be educate students to become the man or woman of mature character, that means the character education or heart education. Heartistic and character education is very important. Secondly, in order to involve with human relationship and creating a happy family, we must educate young people to relate to other people. There is moral standard, ethical standard, and also norms. Then thirdly, also we should educate young people to become good people who have a good career. Through career, they can make a substantial contribution to the society. So the education of knowledge and skill, that is also a very important factor of education. But most of the fundamental foundation is the uh, education of health and heart, education of norm, then education of skill and knowledge. <laughs> But the problem in the, uh, the education, you know, problem of uh, education system in modern days, is uh, the uh, you know, unbalanced. So we must have a balanced education. Then I uh, visit also family, the school of law. Then I the define the true law. What is true law? The most exemplary true law is parental law. Parents sacrifice themselves for the same children unconditionally. There's example of true love. Then also uh, we learn, we cultivate heart and true love through our life, growing in the family. So first we cultivate our heart of children, children heart to the parents. Secondly, brother and sister love and heart in the family. Then when we get married, we develop heart between husband and wife, and eventually we become parents, then we cultivate our heart and love towards our children, parental heart. In the family, parents have the responsibility to educate children properly. First, you know, to become filial son and daughter in the family, secondary, you know, make their make uh, contribution to the society that is uh, patriot. Then eventually, we should educate the uh, children to become the person who lives for, for the sake of all mankind. We may call it same thing sages. <coughs> for the character and hard education, also moral and ethical education, community and family, and school to work together, very harmoniously, cooperatively. So school and community, in one sense, extension of the family. Also I expand the subject to uh, three subject ideas. That means parents, which are not just parents, but also the teacher, also true leader for the children. Likewise, 
uh, teacher in the school must be uh, not just a teacher, but also true parents for the students, also true leaders for the students. As you. <clears throat> now we already enter the 21st century. We are no longer living in the 20th century, right? We live in new millennium, new century. All the world people are hoping that the new century with the dawning of a new culture of peace and unification. If the 20th century is the era of great scientific, technological, economic achievement, the 21st century should become the era of worldwide spiritual renaissance. Yet, for this to happen, we should learn from the experience of the 20th century that science, technology, and economic development alone do not create the proper conditions for peace, harmony, and true happiness. Rather, we need a new universal value-based view of life, which supports the establishment of true families, healthy societies, as well as true nation and world of peace and unification. Our search for such values should integrate the best of spiritual and material values, traditional and contemporary values, and Eastern and Western values. Integrating these complementary views provides more complete context for the appreciation and application of moral and ethical values. The realities of young people's hope and dreams require the cultivation of a strong conscience and part of a true love through the stimulation provided by loving family environment. A strong and pure conscience is the basis for academic excellence personal achievement, family stability, and true citizenship. Our conscience constantly guide us to do what is right. All human beings have conscience. Peace guide us to do what is right. You agree? Yes. Tongima, Tongima. However, due to a corrupt moral environment, our conscience has been unable to function properly. Therefore, we have the responsibility to first purify and liberate our own conscience and in turn help others to do likewise. <coughs> the development of a pure conscience together with the cultivation of a true love will empower young people with the inner strength and desire to live an exemplary life for the, sake, for the sake of others and eventually create happy and healthy families. These are essential features of a truly vibrant spiritual civilization. Through this conference, we hope to further explore these and related issues and how they impact our lives and activities. In recent years, the conference founders, Dr. and Mrs. Moon and their family, pioneered a beautiful tradition called Fundo Pet, which means a gathering to read inspirational words. We would like to request this opportunity to share with you some excerpts from Dr. Mon's words as they relate to the conference theme as a source of wisdom and as a catalyst for discussion. Most sessions will begin with a presentation of these excerpts as they address a particular topic and its associated subtopics. This conference is designed to be a very interactive experience where the participants from the most powerful nations in the world 
Russia, China, and the United States have an unpleasant opportunity to discuss and explore common solutions to the most essential questions of our time. It should be stimulating to examine how character and universal values affect the world of lasting love and help create modern relationships. Once again, I want to express my gratitude to all of you for attending this very meaningful Дорогие коллеги, 
от имени международного движения педагоги за мир за их понимание, Академии педагогических и социальных наук и от моих российских коллег я сердечно приветствую наших дорогих друзей из Китайской Народной Республики и Соединенных Штатов Америки. всей души выражаю признательность Международному фонду образования за инициативу и огромные усилия по проведению серии представительных и очень важных конференций в США, в Китае и в России. От согласия и, или несогласия этих великих держав зависит благополучие мира в 21 веке. Поэтому эта встреча особенно важна. Наши конференции проходят в период одного из сложнейших этапов в истории человечества. Представьте себе, что 2000 лет тому назад, когда человечество вступало в новую эру развития цивилизации, ни один человек на Земле, ну, может быть, кроме одного, не осознавал глубины и масштабов тех преобразований, которые тогда начинались. Сегодня мы являемся участниками и свидетелями нового этапа глубинных преобразований на планете и в развитии цивилизации. Как мне кажется, мы существенно отличаемся от наших предшественников, которые жили 2000 лет тому назад, и должны осознавать, что планета сегодня переходит в новое состояние в результате многовековой, творческой деятельности человека. Это новое состояние планеты. Два великих ученых, русский вернадский Владимир Иванович и преподобный Теяда Шарден, определили как ноосферу с греческого, сферу разума и духа. По выражению вернадского человечество превратилось в геолога, преобразующую силу. Заканчивается технократический этап развития цивилизации. Накоплены огромные знания, и они непрерывно удваиваются. Произошли техническая и информационная революции. Могущество и возможности человечества и даже одного человека приобретают колоссальные, почти неограниченные размеры угрожающие даже уничтожением самой жизни на планете. Планета при жизни одного поколения стала маленькой и хрупкой. Формируется единое человеческое сообщество с теснейшей взаимосвязью и взаимозависимостью народов и государств. Изменения происходят постепенно и незаметно для большинства людей. Накладываясь одно на другое, эти изменения в жизни человека и различных сообществ вызывают напряжение в отношениях людей, разнообразные кризисные явления и угрожают серьезным системным кризисом всему человечеству. Некоторые признаки этого кризиса уже проявляются в различных областях жизни мирового сообщества. Все эти процессы и явления заставляют нас совершенно по-новому пересмотреть свои отношения друг с другом, с обществом и с природой. Не случайно именно на рубеже столетий и тысячелетий, на рубеже эпох появился новый термин – культура мира и ненасилия. А текущий год объявлен ООН – Международным годом культуры мира, а первое десятилетие нового века объявлены международные декады культуры ненасилия и мира в интересах детей планеты. Это новое видение мира предполагает переход от привычной логики сил. Значительная часть населения многих стран, и в частности в России, Многие из них находят в Ямске, находят прямо противоположный выход из той же ситуации. И совершенно недостаточное внимание. Надежду вселяет 
происходящий во многих странах процесс становления гражданского общества, которое формируется в процессе заинтересованного и ответственных войн. История учит. Должно быть высокое чувство ответственности, настроиться на любви и глубоком уважении достоинства человека. Дружно сбережение любви. Глубинных преобразований в мире переходы трудно смириться. Средства массовой информации переполнены насильством сильнее доброго воздействия семьи. И снова я возвращаю на себя ответственность за 21 век, за чистоту отношений. От всей души я желаю участникам конференции негативной и как относятся в Китае и в Соединенных Штатах. Спасибо вам за внимание. Спасибо. Thank you, Dr. Su, Dr. Yang, and Professor Kapachenko, all of our co-sponsoring organizations, Mr. Jack Corley, Tom Phillips, and Tony Devine, and to all our, our distinguished panelists. Good morning. Distinguished ministers, professors, political and business leaders, and most importantly, our students that are here from China, Russia, and the United States. We welcome you, and we're excited to be here with you in this historic conference. The theme of our conference is exploring the ideals of true love and world peace. The implication of this theme is that the basis for peace is to be found in true love. Dr. Moon teaches that there are universal principles that establish the theme of true love, and that those universal principles are to be found both in nature and in the family. In the family, we find the first principle of true love is that true love is related with sacrifice. Parents sacrifice for their children and mothers especially live for the sake of their children. And we find that when there is sacrificial love in the family, the children of those parents are grateful to those parents for all of their lives. Also, we find that in the family, we learn to live for others. And living for others is a universal principle that teaches us that we extend love out for others, live for others, and we find that others want to live for us also. And that is where we find the principle of true love in natural law. Everyone knows without exception that if you sow good, healthy seed in the farmland, you will reap good fruit. Isn't that right? If you sow unhealthy seed, then you have a bad harvest. Universal law. What we propose in the area of true love is that if you sow good seeds of love for the sake of others, then you will reap a harvest of love for your family and for your nation. Thank you. We are here to bring about world peace and to bring about a mutual respect and love for these three great nations of China, Russia, and America. To really turning the other cheek, that universal law will eventually bring about a good result. Then when we come to America, we find that the great influence of Tolstoy even in That is true love, loving your enemy. And it is say to our Chinese delegation, we love you, China. We love you, China. And now to our Russian delegation, we love you, Russia. That is the spirit of true love. And now all of us together, let's stand and say, we love everybody. Thank you.
，实景好，就是尊敬的汤尼·安永先生，呃，尊敬的各位贵宾，尊敬的各位代表，先生们、女士们、女士们、先生们，今天我非常荣幸的来到这个会议会场上，那么本来没有我的讲话，因为陈玉云教授啊，他的嗓子不好。不能够发表他的作作和词，所以今天我代表他来，呃，向大会啊致作词。我们呢正处在一个世纪之交，在二十世纪的时候，人类的物质文明、科学技术得到前所未有的重大的进步，但是我们也面临了一个，就是说跟这个进步完全。Uh, this concludes uh, our morning session, but there's a few housekeeping uh, details. Uh, just bear with me one minute. Uh, for the American delegation, those of you who took the program in Russian, uh, you can exchange that outside during this break. For the... <laughs>
we'd like to uh, ask. Thank you. Так вот, 
эта вся масса людей, по сути, дискриминирована в современном обществе. Они лишены того, что полагается по природе человеку, семьи, своего жилья, своей квалификации и уважения, должного уважения к окружающим. Как могут, они протестуют против своей контркультуры, воинствующей враждебной господствующей культуре взрослых. И вот э, сейчас, прямо с этой конференции, я отправлюсь на заседание комиссии федеральной целевой программы «Молодежь России», рассчитанной на пять лет, созданной по приказу президента России, единственная задача которой – Помочь нашей молодежи, возможно, дольше оставаться молодым, но, возможно, скорее перестать быть молодежью и стать полноценным гражданом страны. А, ну и вот в таком положении, когда люди оказываются, взрослые люди оказываются на положении подростков десятилетиями, становится извращенным само понятие любви. Мой друг, японский профессор Йошикаци Сакамото, лет 30 назад в беседе со мной сказал, вы, европейцы, странные люди, вы непонятные люди, вы называете любовью чисто физиологические процессы, которые имеют гораздо меньшее значение, чем пищеварение. Тем не менее у вас вся, все искусство. С утра до вечера вы как мартовские коты поете песни вот об этих пищеварительных физиологических процессах. Целость народа. Это расплата. Ну, по 30-летие, если все останется так же, как сейчас. Чечня, многие горячие точки нашего человечества. И я повторю, то, что вы не имеют значение той истинной любви, о которой мне говорил 30 лет назад профессор Вишиканса Цыганова. Спасибо. It's also a special challenge, as Michael Jenkins had noted, to discuss literature in a nation famous for some of the giants of all literature, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, among many others. Early in the 20th century, American President Theodore Roosevelt claimed that to educate someone in mind and not in morals is to educate a menace to society. Unfortunately, many in the education profession have failed to understand President Roosevelt's important insight. But we must expand his idea. Not only must we rejoin schooling with the development of each student's individual character, we must also help students to see the importance of developing both their civic responsibility and their capability for healthy interpersonal relationships. Our failure to teach matters of virtue and character is usually not just an oversight. Schools ought to make a conscious choice to focus on the development of academic talents and leave the student's character growth and ability to care for others as someone else's responsibility. As a result, American students have often suffered a dangerous separation of intellectual growth from the development of their moral capacity and their ability to understand and to learn from others. Many recent efforts to resolve the moral crises of our young have succumbed to the temptation of blaming the youth. But responsible moral educators must avoid doing so. Of course, each new generation worries about its children, their morals and their behavior. But how can it be that when each generation was between 10 and 20 years old, it was disrespectful and a little selfish with less than perfect manners. Then, as that generation grew quickly to become parents during their 20s and 30s, they somehow experienced an, an ethical epiphany which causes them to claim superiority over the generation 
right after them. The reality, of course, is that adolescence is a time of confusion. The young people appear disrespectful and self-centered, and at times they surely are. But complete candor requires, requires us to observe, as well, that sometimes the older generation deserves to be questioned. As educators, we should take comfort from the fact that today's version of these problems, though important and intense, are really not unique nor apocalyptic. That comfort should restrain us from one of the most deadly educational sins, haste. Literature is of particular value because it too resists haste. Good authors require us to reflect, to slow down, to pay attention to details, and to complexity. Good stories do not have quick fixes or simplistic solutions. They cause us to care and to think carefully. May I turn to one of my intellectual heroes? <coughs> Pardon me. Mark Twain. He usually meets two of my standards for an intellectual. He's amusing. He's clarifying. He once observed, to be good is noble, but to teach others how to be good is nobler and is easier. Families and cultures, as well as with community, time and place. To think narratively is to think in story form. Ideas are lived out in the attentions, decisions, and experiences of individuals. A prophecy form analytic thought. Which just for each virtue, several diverse literary selections reveal to simple generosity, to self-sacrificing generosity, voice literature to improve students' judgments is the Loving One Project. This program for adolescents uses a range of stories, poems, and essays to dance. Loving, intimate, and caring relationships involve special ways of relating that imagining each other is not just a luxury. Good stories show us how to imagine others more fully occurs when individuals are involved in personal relationships and understand new and better ways of living together. But that special place in his life for over 13 months, a woman who he had never seen, yet whose written words has sustained him, Lieutenant Landry men do. Next time you doubt, you're tenderly, so understandingly. Her name was on the book. At this point, we interrupt the story. And we ask the teachers to discuss the following questions with the class. What do you think Lieutenant Blanford did? What should he do? This would not be love, but it would be something precious, a friendship for which he had just he had been and must ever be grateful. He squared his shoulders, saluted, and held this is all about, son. That lady in the green suit begged me to wear this rose on my coat. She said, if you ask me to go out with you, I should tell you, and the author's ending. And soon they come to discuss whether Hollis Maynell's plan was clever, laudable, reasonable, careful. very interesting project, I suppose, of, of course, the conference. Um, my question to this whole conference, everybody, is what is the standard for attending true love? Um, because I guess that's what we've been discussing. Um, I think all of us have different ideas of what true love or different meanings. I think we should kind of define um, kind of having some kind of idea on how to define that true love, not just family, because some of us come from incredibly um, incredible families and others who have no idea what a great family, what true love is and how to um, achieve that. I guess um, it should be great to clarify that. Here you say, uh, try to find true love. Most of our work with students as they come to understand the concept of love, centers on there has to be an intense caring. You do want to know how the other person is doing. 
And there has to be a great deal of respect for the essence of the other character, the other person. There has to be a great deal of knowledge. You have to really know a variety of nuances about love. That's the virtue of the stories. And I think in a loving relationship, there's a healthy respect for growth of each character. And that's why I was using the phrase from Alan Reganis about it's really important to take care that we attempt to understand and imagine each other and try to get the person. Россия, Москва, Тамара Базовева, президент международного концерта «Экология человека». Истинная любовь, всеобщий мир невозможен без решения экологических проблем, которые возникли на планете Земля. Сначала ресурсные проблемы, потом биосферные. И вот как раз человеческая проблема. У меня вопрос к прислуживу Влада. Какое место займет вот эта проблема в будущем становлении истинной любви, истинного отношения к жизни? И как можно вот это ускорить, исходя из заката технократической цивилизации? Спасибо. Тридцать лет назад Римский клуб опубликовал несколько докладов, согласно которым человечеству в его настоящем положении осталось жить не более 80 лет. Из них 30 уже прошли. Но прошло несколько лет, и футурологи мира не захотели смириться с таким положением вещей. Мы не животные, которых гонят на бойню, и которые должны ну, ждать своего конца. Так родилось еще одно направление исследования будущего. Оно называется альтернативистика. альтернативистика. Это пути перехода к цивилизации, альтернативно существующей и способной решить все современные проблемы. У нее пять индикаторов, пять показателей. Первое – это чистая энергетика, новая энергия. Второе – это устойчивое развитие, не совсем точный перевод, состоятельный. Третье – это разоружение, заумное. Четвертое – это экологичность, начало по-английски, по-русски нет эквивалента, но смысл заключается в том, что экологический критерий должен быть первым. Не экономический, не технический, не политический, не социальный а экологически. И, наконец, пятый и последний индикатор – это гуманизация, human, гуманизация образования и гуманизация культуры. В образом экологии входит сюда органической составной части, в том числе и экологии человека. Мой коллега совершенно справедливо сказал о том, и вопрос был очень конструктивный, что любовь – это, конечно же, не семья. Но я сказал в шутку, что любовь – это большое нешествие, потому что любить по-настоящему – значит растворить свою жизнь в жизни любимого человека. Так, как растворяет свою жизнь в жизни любимого ребенка настоящей мать. Это очень тяжело, это не всем дано, но это и есть истинное счастье. Это и есть сердцевина экологии человека. Спасибо. China from Beijing. My name is Yang. I'm 29 years old. I want to ask uh, the question is, uh, mm, I just married in this year, uh, May 27, and uh, my wife also here. And uh, she just uh, been outside. Uh, after two hours, she come back. I think the first year for the marriage is very important. So um, I want to ask uh, for the mm, uh, what's the advice for uh, the kind of people like me and uh, uh, how, how to make the uh, family uh, uh, all the time uh, keep perfect and uh, um, what the um, poor love should we keep? Uh, something like this. 
I think uh, you are the professional on the stage uh, for the live. So um, I think it's very important for us. Thank you very much. So you can see what the Loving Well Project has to say about this. I thought that discussing literature among these literary giants was a challenge, but now to be asked how to uh, enable people to start a perfect family after one year is probably beyond my skill. <laughs> but I would, again, recommend that the marriage include not only a great deal of self-sacrifice by each member, but that it also include a great deal of respect for the spirit of each individual and the eventual growth of each individual. If we don't plan on growing and changing and looking forward to that and sharing that with each other and helping each other understand it, uh, we probably are headed for misery. So the idea of having perfection, perhaps at any time, but especially early on, might be dangerous. I would uh, recommend that we turn our attention more to the intimate caring and respect and careful attention to each other. And I think that would pay off uh, ultimately more than a, a commitment to perfection. That would worry me a little bit. Okay. Each other and elect a chairperson. No, organize and make these groups. Okay, I'd like to ask our conference staff to go throughout the auditorium in just a few minutes. Молодежи поездов 
долговечные люди. Мы здесь не идеальные, а долговечные. По-моему, правда есть турнир. Потому что идеально, идеала можно никогда не дать. Критерием оценки в данном случае работы это прибавочный стоит. Да? Ну, кстати, это мы в этом общем Ну, сказать, что мы что-то не видим, так слишком на это бывает. Сразу так все наши темы. Это попроще можно? Попроще. Вообще, что тебя спрашивают, что ты скажешь. Детям дать понимание, что любовь на языке очень важна.
Hello, I'm Edward Wallace from Ohio, and in our group was Eric from uh, New York and Gotham from Los Angeles, along with Tom Johnson and Cindy Callender from uh, Ohio, and Tim Birdsong from uh, Moscow. Um, I won't repeat the questions since we've all got them into the first question, however. The reply was that the ethical purpose entails uh, love. Without ethical and moral purpose, this would be the antithesis to love. Ultimate purpose of love is to love others and incarnate oneself to the task to serve the community. This is the foundation of, of Christianity. It's the foundation of spirituality. One good example is the Ten Commandments. And I love Jesus' reply to the Pharisees that on uh, the greatest commandment is that we should love God and love each other. And on those two, hang all the law and the prophets. So that's, that's a part of that. Question number two, true love and community, acceptance, uh, independence and in action and experience. I feel like that's what you know, people are looking for. What is ideal love? Love is dynamic. Love is lasting. Love for a superior being. We cannot love oneself unless we've learned to love a superior, supreme being, and therefore we cannot love others if we don't love the supreme being and learn to love self. Love has different forms. And then the fourth question, uh, how does a person protect their love? By sharing it uh, with, with like-minded people. One of the major problems with uh, Oak is that they sometimes are not around like-minded people, and then they tend to be led astray and led out into the wilderness of, uh, of sin and, and problems in life. By keeping a perspective of, on values <laughs> and morality and perceiving positive, bright uh, aspects for the future. We do have a bright future, and we need to protect ourselves uh, for that future. And that leads us to the last question, how does abstinence relate to love? It protects it. It uh, allows for the holistic development of true and lasting love, and therefore we should encourage abstinence at all costs. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really concise. That's what we're looking for. Okay, from Russia, uh, we'll we have a report from one of our Russian groups now. Друзья, я делаю попытку выделить эту сцену уже третий раз в Америке. В Китае наконец и стоялась, наконец я вышла. И скажу то, что я хочу сказать. Рязань, Лариса Шмакова. Я представляю группу, в которую входит еще Бурятская ССР, Иркутск, Санкт-Петербург, Петрозаводск, Пермь. Вот все люди входят в нашу группу. Я задам сейчас всем вопрос, и вы поднятие руки на него ответите. Скажите, пожалуйста, кто из вас хочет быть счастливым? Опустите, пожалуйста, руки. Итак, есть такая проблема – быть счастливым, которая волнует всех людей, независимо от цвета кожи, национальности, возраста. А что такое счастье? Наверное, каждый из вас сказал бы, что счастье – это исполнение желаний. А желания бывают разные. Одни счастливы от того, что вот только родились, ходят по земле и счастливы. Это очень низкий уровень счастья. Более высокий уровень счастья – второй, так сказать. Это от того, что у меня очень много денег. К сожалению, очень многие сейчас находятся на таком уровне, считая, что имея много денег, они будут счастливыми. Третий уровень счастья. Я счастлив от того, что общаюсь с другими людьми. Еще более высокий уровень счастья. У меня открылся талант. И, наконец, самый высокий уровень счастья. Я счастлив от того, что делаю счастливыми других людей. Наверное, истинная любовь заключается в том, что... Человек, любящий истину, делает, способен делать, готов к тому, чтобы делать счастливым другого человека. И здесь огромная роль в воспитании такого человека лежит в семье. И сейчас я молодежи в основном говорю о том, что... А что же такое семья? Я Хорошо. А значит, что же такое семья? Когда к ребятам я шла на урок и прочитала, что семья – это основа общество, ячейка общества это очень сухо, ни о чем не говорит. Я думала, что этого будет недостаточно. Я нашла с помощью замечательных людей такое определение. Оно содержится в Библии. Семья – это семья. Семь – это святая цифра по Библии. Я 
что такое я? Семья. Давайте на пальчиках отложим. И все станет нам ясно. Семья. Семья. Я. Вера. Надежда. Любовь. Мудрость. Мужество. Умеренность и справедливость. Итак, для того, чтобы семья была семьей, отвечая всем молодым людям, надо сформировать в себе этих семь нравственных качеств. Нравственные качества, не случайно о них идет речь, не случайно мы говорим сегодня, что нравственное воспитание, этическое воспитание – это основа общества. Давайте сформируем себе эти нравственные качества, давайте изменим себя соответственно этим качествам, и тогда семья станет семьей. И нам в этом поможет пособие, которое создано Международным фондом образования, замечательное пособие «Я в мире людей», «Мой мир и я», «Тут по суку». И мы видим замечательные книги, таких книг еще не бывало. А сейчас они есть, и надо ими пользоваться. Большое спасибо.北京、中国的上海、北京、湖北、湖南、中国的东北的三个省份，还有其他地区，呃，河北。这些代表呢，在对这次会议的呃这几个题目啊，刚才进行的讨论中呢，有这么几个呃想法，希望能够和大家呢
bring my apologies and explanations in concerning of the translation of what I have said previously. В российской социологии употребляются термины культура, антикультура и контркультура и субкультура. термин антикультура имеет образный синоним теневая культура. Шедевр. First, I want to give greetings from America, particularly from Brooklyn, New York. And I just want to thank God for this opportunity to share with you briefly on the significance of marriage. What is marriage? And why is marriage important? Marriage is important because it is the role to finding love. It is a role to creating life. It is a role where the, man, where the life of a man and a woman unite into one. It is the place where a man's lineage combines with the woman's lineage. History emerges through marriage, and from marriage, nations appear, and an ideal world begins. Without marriage, there is no meaning to the existence of individuals, nations, and an ideal world. Number two. Marriage can be said to be a ceremony which allows you to open the door of a place of happiness and enter into it. Therefore, marriage is the biggest event for humankind. Love transcends time and space and is the greatest thing. Marriage is a ceremony that reveals and confirms this greatest love. What is the purpose of marriage? Is it simply for men and women to live together? The purpose of marriage is the perfection of their mind and heart and the perfection of their love. Thank you so much. Can you hear me if I use this portable mic? Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give a warning to China and Russia. There are some wonderful things to follow from Americans who have an open global society but one thing I stress for you never to do, and that is never throw out moral absolutes. In the 1960s, my generation, and I apologize for my generation to all of you young people sitting in here, because we thought there was such a thing as free love, free sex, anything goes, and there'd be no consequences. In the past 30 years, research has shown that the consequences are over 50% divorce in America. One out of four beautiful young people called teenagers is carrying a sexually transmitted disease who are sexually active. There are over 27 sexually transmitted diseases now, thanks to my generation. Poverty has increased in America in that 30 years by 630% after factoring out inflation. Violent crime has increased 560% in 30 years in my nation. What a tragedy. Suicide in our youth has increased 200%. And our national academic test, called the SATs, has lowered their point score to lower than 80 points from the 1960s to the 1990s. And now one third of all babies born in America are born to single mothers out of wedlock with no husband to help them financially. Please don't follow our example. Hold on to moral absolutes, teach good health practices, and encourage your young people because as you'll see in just a second, they are so capable of doing the right thing and being healthy and whole. I'm going to use three demonstrations. Normally, my presentation is two hours. I'm not going to do that to you. I'm going to use three demonstrations to demonstrate a couple of points. We've heard the problems. Where are the solutions? And let's look and see where they are. First of all, these three young people are coming up here. Scott is going to represent, come on here, Scott. He is going to represent bacteria and virus. He has a plate full of dirt, and that's bacteria and virus. And Scott is bad boy virus and bacteria, okay? Look at that. He's tough, he's tough, all right. 
these two young ladies, one on each side of Scott, please, are going to represent females, and this is a biology lesson. I hope I don't offend anyone. But inside of a female, above the vagina and below the uterus, is what is called a cervical lining. In a female over the age of 20, the cervical lining is fully developed. It is thick, it is not moist, and it's no longer permeable, which means there are not microscopic holes in it for things to pass through. Under the age of 20 to 21, a cervical lining is thin, it's moist, and it's permeable, which means whatever it comes in contact with can go directly into the bloodstream. We're going to pretend that this young lady over the age of 21 comes in contact with virus and bacteria. Would you put that cervical lining flat? Put flat. Now press down on the vi virus and bacteria. Now hold that up high. Okay? Some of you can see this front. There's a few virus. Would you take this cervical lining of someone under the age of 20 to 21 that has an immature cervical lining and hold that up? Press that up there. Hold that up real high. Do you see the difference? This is why one out of four of our American youth that are sexually active have a sexually transmitted disease. This cervical lining, these bacteria and virus will go directly into the bloodstream and be with this beautiful young lady for the rest of her life if this was a real life demonstration. Do you understand why we're at such risk? Our anatomical bodies are not ready for sex with more than one person, and especially before the age of 20 to 21. Thank you very much. I'm going to put your line, your, your light on a timeline, which is what we do with our youth. Would you come over here? This is Burr. What do you say? Okay. He is Burr. Every step I take represents 10 years. From birth to puberty, it's about 15 years until there are young people who are in full-fledged puberty. So here's 10, here's half a step, 15. Puberty, come on up here. Puberty is a time of the life when your hormones are going absolutely ballistic, okay? They're looking at the other opposite sex and they're going, wow, they are awesome looking. And, and the hormones are raging. The emotions are on a roller coaster, and that's okay, that's very normal. Many of our youth are confused about their sexuality. That is not, not, not unnormal. That is normal. There's nothing wrong with our young people. They will settle down when they reach about 20 to 21. And this hormonal surge will balance itself out. Okay, this is birth to puberty. Marriage in our nation, the average age is 25. So from 15 to 25 is one step. Would you come up here, marriage? All right. Come right over here. Here we go. Okay. From marriage to death, our people die about the age of 75. So from 25, 35, 45, 55, 65, 75. She's off the chart here, okay? That's the time of life when you're done, right? All right. I'm going to talk about right here. This is the time of your life. This is a time that sex was meant for, but unfortunately, sometimes, especially in my nation, we take it out of that timeline and we put it right here. Now, this is only one small step. And if we can teach our young people to set boundaries and set standards for their dating, if they're going to date, then they will have the best marriage of all. They'll be able to have a playground all the way through here, and now they can have sex for the day they die because of a drug called Viagra, right? Yeah. Bring the suitcase over here. Okay. Now, the problem with a lot of young people is they don't realize that the best sex is in marriage, but when they have a lot of sex before marriage, they bring baggage into their marriage. In this baggage, they might have diseases. One of the 27 to go to bed with every time they want to go to bed with their spouse. They might have pregnancy. They might bring in birth or something else.
Because if they don't have sexual self-control here, in this one little step, what is going to guarantee that they have it here? The number one reason for divorce in our nation is sex outside of their marriage commitment because they had no self-control here. They have a very difficult time staying controlled here and staying faithful. So if we want faithful, healthy, whole marriages, we empower our young people to wait this one small step. Thank you. Very much. In our country, we have the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. It's a huge government branch that tells everybody how to be safe and not be harmed. That particular branch tells all of our healthcare workers, whether they're doctors, nurses, dentists, or dental hygienists, that if you're going to touch body fluids in order to avoid getting AIDS, or HIV that leads to AIDS, or other sexually transmitted diseases, you must wear all of this covering. His eyes are covered. This is Justin, my son. Thanks, Justin. His eyes are covered. His mouth, his nose are covered. His gown is non-permeable, so if something splashes on it, it does not go through it, but it rolls off it. He has latex gloves on that are seven times thicker than latex condoms, and he has no body part showing so that if he comes in contact with a disease, he will not catch it. Now this is what we tell our adults in America. And those same health professionals tell our young people, don't you worry. You just get naked, take off all your clothes, and you wear one of these and you're going to be just fine. There's not a problem. <laughs> Do you see the different messages we teach our young people? You see, they don't think our young people are anything more than a bunch of animals, and that is a lie. They don't give our young people credit for having enough common sense to say, I am worth the wait, and so is my future spouse. They don't understand that young people need encouragement and empowerment. And they don't understand that because we threw out our moral absolutes, we are reaping a whirlwind of disaster when it comes to our nation, our societal woes. So I want to encourage you, empower your young people, believe in your young people, and know that when given all the information, they can make these kinds of choices to wait. Now, I want to end with one thing because no one is telling our young people the truth about one sexually transmitted disease. It's called HPV. Thank you, Joseph. Human papillomavirus. Human papillomavirus is a skin-to-skin -skin contact disease, and it is not spread by fluids. The skin-to-skin -skin contact disease is responsible for the majority of deaths of females, which are 5,000 a year in America due to cervical cancer. Now they're doing research, prostate cancer, oral cancers, anal cancers, because of HPV, human papillomavirus. It is gonna overtake AIDS. It already is in America, but we don't hear much about it because you see we don't have a solution for it other than abstinence. And I will end with a quote from the National Institute of Health. In 1996, at a health conference, this was stated by the National Institute of Health, I quote, the data on the use of barrier methods of contraception, which are condoms, to prevent the spread of human papillomavirus are controversial, but do not, do not support this as an effective method of prevention. The Centers for Disease Control, their committee on HIV and sexually transmitted diseases, quoted from Dr. King, who's a medical doctor. He said, quote, the facts are the latest studies looking at women over a time show that women who use condoms consistently had the same rate of acquiring human papilloma virus as women who did not use condoms at all. Our young people are valuable, and they can be taught to save sex from marriage so they can have the best marriages and the best sex lives. Thank you very much. Director of the Order
Oriental Education Center. Since becoming an educator in 1958, that's 42 years in the educational field, he served in four different schools as a teacher, director, and principal. In 1983, he became the director of the Basic Education Division of the Moral Education Department of the Chinese Ministry of Education. Now, for our Russian and American delegations, let me put that into perspective. In that capacity, with the Ministry of Education, the Division of Moral Education, the Director of Basic Education, Mr. Sun was responsible for the character education program for 17 years for 210 million students and more than 10 million teachers, professors, and instructors. <coughs> Mr. Sun is currently serving in a variety of positions as the Executive Vice President of the China Ex Education Association, the Middle School Moral Education Committee, and Vice President of the China Education Association Reforming Education Committee, and many, many others. He is, of course, the author and editor of several books on moral development and character education. He will share on an intriguing topic. The noble character is the first aim of life. Please warmly welcome with me, Mr. Sun Tsui Chen. Hello 当我听到了美国由于性解放、性自由所带来的严重的社会后果以后我认为爱情、结婚都必须要你们通过自己辛勤的劳动去创。How do responsibility and commitment impact love? We had earned, starting from the first row, four people. Можно добиться близких отношений с коллегами по работе, но все же наиболее близкие, наиболее тесные отношения – это отношения в семье. Только там человек может наиболее полно 
быть единым с другим человеком, разделить с ним все свои радости и горести. В чем заключается роль сексуальности? Естественно, для взаимоотношений очень важно думать больше о духовности. И, в общем-то, это то, что определяет систему ценностей, отношение к духовным вопросам, определяет то, куда будет двигаться семья. Но, тем не менее, сексуальность, конечно, тоже важна. Хотя... впечатление от конференции. Меня зовут Шамин Роман, я учусь в Саратском техническом университете на инженер-строителе. Ну, впечатление очень, очень приятное, очень э, такое хорошее впечатление от того, что собирается много людей с разными мнениями, а по сути все говорят об одном и том же. Все говорят вот о тех ценностях, которые рассматриваются на этой конференции. Ну, это очень важно, как как для меня, так я думаю, для каждого человека, что люди именно находят объединение вот на этой конференции разной национальности, разных профессий и разных взглядов. Спасибо большое. Здравствуйте. Какое ваше впечатление от конференции? Я думаю, что впечатление, как и у большинства участников этой конференции, очень хорошее. Те проблемы, которые сегодня представятся в вашей песне. Как ваше впечатление от конференции? Я работаю проректором Московского государственного университета культуры и искусств Смирнов Генрит Антонович. Мне думается, что сегодняшняя конференция затронула очень важные проблемы, которые касаются в первую очередь культуры. Это культура семьи, это культура любви. Думается, что проблемы, которые близки не только старшему поколению, но в первую очередь молодым людям. Не случайно, вот так естественно, органично очень сегодня и с трибуны, и в зале во время дискуссии были рассмотрены сложнейшие вопросы. Это что такое брак, что такое семья, что такое истинная любовь. Думается, что Моменты, связанные с открытием истины, у многих молодых людей будут связаны с нашей конференцией. Добрый день, моя фамилия Черторицкая, Татьяна Владимировна. Сегодня мне была доверена очень большая честь, я открывала нынешнюю конференцию. Я директор региональных программ Межрегионального фонда Согласия и в прошлом депутат Государственной Думы. Впечатление очень хорошее. Я считаю, что чем больше будет таких конференций, тем будет лучше, потому что и до нашего правительства, и до нашего депутатского корпуса, к сожалению, с большим трудом доходит мысль, что необходимо внедрять такие понятия семья, молодежь, культура, образование в политическую жизнь страны. Необходимо, чтобы эти понятия стали приоритетами российской политики. Об этом мы говорили и в тех группах с людьми из самых разных регионов России. Они просили меня специально передать это, донести до сведения всех людей, которые хоть в какой-то мере ответственны за формирование политики и за решение важных государственных задач. Если мы не сейчас, вот как и раньше, не будем обращать внимание на проблемы семьи и образования, у нас не будет будущего. А впечатления действительно превосходные. Вы знаете, иногда ну, милые, наивные, чудные, молодые люди, конечно, они еще мало что знают и о браке, и о семье, но очень важно, очень важно то, что они хотят в этом разобраться. Они уже, еще не создав семьи, они уже очень серьезно относятся к семье, к выбору спутника жизни. И вот с, то, что вот, вот эта осознанность, серьезный подход уже сейчас присущ молодежи, я считаю, что это одно из самых главных достижений этой конференции. Чем больше будет таких конференций, тем будет лучше. Спасибо вам большое. Спасибо большое. Я хотел бы в самом начале 
сказать, что все, что здесь говорится на этой конференции, это говорится больше в плане нравственно-психологического. Моя специальность, моя профессия – социолог, и я буду говорить как социолог о проблемах сильной, крепкой и устойчивой семьи. И эта проблема, она сразу обращает наше внимание к положению семьи как социального института среди других социальных институтов. И надо сказать прямо, что наши исследования, вот российских ученых, и эти исследования мы проводим совместно с... Я, по всякому случаю, в своей жизни проводил исследования с различными зарубежными коллегами. Кстати говоря, две книги, с автором которых я являюсь, переведены на китайский язык. И одна монография по сравнению американской и российской семьи выпущена в Миннесотском университете в 1994 году. Поэтому в общем, научном плане мы довольно хорошо знаем друг друга, и у социологов здесь нет других мнений. Социальный институт семьи находится везде в мире в положении солушки. То есть вот той неродной и всеми, так сказать, вот эксплуатируемой дочери в семействе общественном. И моя задача сегодня показать, как и каким образом сложилось это неравноправное положение семьи среди других социальных институтов, хотя все институты вышли из семьи, и самых главных институтов – церковь и государство, которые много сотен лет боролись за свое влияние на семью. И надо признать прямо, что в современном мире мы переживаем ситуацию, когда видим, как повсеместно, везде, во всех странах мира, государство победило церковь в своем влиянии на семью. И, может быть, это было последним так сказать, вот ударом по положению семьи в мире. Потому что семья теперь э, находится в подчиненном положении служанки, я бы даже сказал, содержанки э, вот, государства. И э, благодаря этому государство имеет непосредственный выход на индивида и гнемную семью как вечного культурологического посредника между институтом вот, семьи и э, обществом, мы лишились вот этой вот роли семьи, э, и поэтому сейчас государство имеет возможность непосредственно влиять на индивида. И именно поэтому современное сознание индивида и Дорогие русские друзья, здравствуйте, как ваше настроение? Coming from the uh, United States and uh, living now in Russia for eight years with my four children, uh, receiving a very excellent education, not only technical, but also moral education in Russia, and having been to China more than 30 times in the past <coughs> four years, uh, I've come to feel from my experience how much these three great cultures have uh, to share with one another. And we can see here in this room that despite our differences, we're able to draw together through our discussion on the universal values that are being covered here on love, family, and marriage. I think that possibly in this way, uh, we are building bridges that perhaps until this time, politicians and journalists have been able, unable to do. So one common thing, if we can have the first slide now, uh, one thing that is common to all of us is uh, the pursuit for happiness in all of our endeavors. And this happy, uh, maybe we could have some of the lights down so that they can see the lights a little bit. Someone in the hall can get some of the lights, please. Okay. Now, 
This happiness is realized through the fulfillment of our desires. Uh, can I have the second slide, please? However, without a clear understanding of the true purpose of life, which is actually the Our vocabulary into our lives 
a new concept that's able to transcend all languages, cultures, nationalities, ethnicities, as well as professions. Mind you, that we are living in a very, very complex world and it's becoming more and more complex every single day. We have a tendency in our modern world, in our modern universe, to pigeonhole and to categorize people in neatly compartmental boxes, saying that one is somebody who's purely an academic who type on a computer. The world stage and the environment that the world faces today is changing. No longer can we fall back on the old 20th century ideas of compartmentalization and of narrowly defining people according to whatever category we've come to present. Because my friends, between nations, between people of different colors, between people of different cultures, it is time that we expand our vision of humanity. We expand that understanding of what we should be, we start defining it today by some idealistic vision or you would not be gathered here. Because the topic of this conference is something that's so grandiose. It's something that reaches for the stars, looks for the possibilities. For an insight to build bridges across cultures, across nations. This comes to the notion then that if we truly want to build world peace, it's the individual person first that has to be the agent to bring about that peace. Now, if individuals take upon them this mission of living for the sake of others, eventually, as that message grows beyond a handful of people to a nation, to a world, then you are building a substantial foundation and furtherment of world peace. Where, is, where does the individual then learn this ideal of true love, living for the sake of others? This goes directly to the substance and essence of we'll have children. Now, it doesn't matter if you are a Korean, or if you are a Moscovite, or Russian, or if you are an American, or if you're an African, you have a family, parents, a wife, brothers and sisters, and children. If we're able to cultivate the relationships, ideal relationships, in that family unit, that knowledge can be ours to then project to people of different colors, to project to people of different cultures, to project to people that are different from ourselves. Because, you know what? I had a chance to visit many, many, many different countries. I had a chance to talk to many, many different people of many, many different <coughs> backgrounds, cultures, ethnicity, uh, race. And everybody understands the language of love. Everybody can be thankful when somebody tries to live for their sake. They recognize that love. It's a universal language. You don't have to be a PhD in English to be able to be a master of this universal language. You don't have to go to a university and get a diploma to be a master of this language. It is something that you cultivate in the substantial relationships that you build within your family. Yet, if this is the case, the premise that the, that the family is a school of love, my friends, it is a disturbing fact in this modern circumstance, modern world, that it is the very family that should be the source in which people understand this love. It is the family that is being attacked. That is the family that is being broken. It is the family that's being rent asunder. Now I know that all great nations, all great societies value family. Once that nation or that society or that people 
lose focus on that basic social unit that maintains stability and harmony, the family, that teaches the young people to live for the sake of others, the family, then my friends, that nation, that society is in jeopardy and is in danger. I had a chance to speak to leaders in the United States in the area of politics, academia, religion, and, uh, and uh, social community leaders. And I constantly gave them a common theme. You know, I told them, America is a great nation. I would say it's one of the greatest nations in the world today. And it's taking, it's, it's even greater because they recognize the international responsibility for the sake of the world. Yet, if we look at America today, America is not threatened by any foreign power. America can stand strong against any other nation in the world. But look internally. Where is the threat? It's internal. And what is the source of that instability? It is the breakdown of the family. The young people today in that nation do not recognize the value of others. That is why you see young, uh, the incident, the tragic incident in Columbine, Colorado, where a young man walked into a school and killed his fellow classmates, unheard of, unprecedented in American history. And these incidents are not just one or two but are becoming more and more frequent in every single community within the United States. Now, is this purely an American problem? I believe not. While I was in the speaking tour of Asia, and I was in Japan, there was an incident there where a young boy, 17 years old, hijacked a, a bus and killed an elderly lady. This, once again, in the nation of Japan was unheard of. It opened up a lot of eyes as to what is fundamentally wrong here. Now, is this, isn't it just some, something that is uh, relevant to these developed nations such as America and Japan? I think not. Even my nation of Korea, that valued family, that was built on the Confucian ideals of family, you're seeing tragedies committed by young people that was unheard of 20, 30 years ago. And I'm sure that as uh, many representatives here in Russia, this, uh, this, this great nation, as well as China, if you look at the domestic issues that are happening in your, in your nation, you'll realize that there's more and more problems with the young people. And the world definitely needs a solution. Now that solution, I believe, is the resurrection of the ideal family, of the ideal of the family. Why do you think this is a common theme? It's a common theme. It transcends nations. It transcends language. It transcends culture. It transcends differences. It's something that's common and unique each and every one of us. Now, building a true family culture, that is something that takes effort. And that is something that needs to be uh, clearly explained. Because I believe that somehow that ideal has been lost. Now, if we use this notion of true love as our barometer of whether that true family culture is being established, then I believe we have some compass to guide direction of our, of our youth, and, and once again, rebuild our families. Now, what is that barometer? Once again, going back to the theme of this conference, it is the ideal of true love, sacrificial love. If a young person, let's look at it from a young person's point of view. If a young person does not cultivate a sense of true love within them, willing to sacrifice for his parents, or willing to sacrifice for his brothers and sisters, a willingness to sacrifice for his uh, wife or her wife, or husband, a willingness to sacrifice for their children. 
How can we maintain the stability of that family unit? If we cannot maintain the stability of that family unit, how can we maintain the stability of a larger society? That is, that is a collection of these family units. How can we maintain the stability of a nation as a collection of these many different societies? How can we maintain the stability of the world as a collection of these many different nations? So if we want to fundamentally address this problem of world peace, mind you, it has to go back down to the most common denominator, the individual. We have to somehow instigate or instill in the youth, the young person, a sense of social purpose that goes beyond themselves, that goes towards their parents, their siblings, their children, their spouse, the society at large, the nation, and eventually the world. And what better way to start that education process than by resuscitating the ideal? My friends, mm -hmm. I know but I would say that that common ideal, that common vision, if it's not rooted in the resuscitation of the family, it will fail. We've seen it over and over and over again in history. It will fail. So I want to urge you and encourage you that this conference, conference is exploring two basic ideas, this ideal of pure love education and family culture, as well as the ideal of world peace. That you bring these two concepts together because eventually one is working to establish the other. If we recognize this connection, and we recognize and find ways in which we can build the bridges on a personal level by first establishing two families of our own, and then in our societies helping others to establish two families, thus building a stronger, stable social unit, then spread, expand outwards to build a stronger nation that recognizes the value of family. Once we do that on the national base, basement, expand further to build that same base on a worldwide level. I am telling you, we can build the foundation for world peace because we're focusing on that which is common to each and every one of us. Not things that separate us, that differentiate us. Not things that we cannot relate to as individuals. It is something that we can all understand and grasp. So my friends, I would like each and every one of you, I would like to challenge you. Because as a young man with a future ahead of him, I've been fortunate to have very good education, internal education, from my parents that gave me the ability to strive and to excel in many interests that I had in my professional and in my personal life. Because I believe that the strength of character is what propels you to achieve great things. So truly, what I've accomplished in my life, I owe to my parents, education. But of course, I've been fortunate to have studied in some of the best institutions in the, in the world, and therefore have the opportunity to make tremendous advancements for myself in whatever area that, that I see fit. But I've made a conscious effort because I believe in this issue, and I believe that more and more people should believe in this issue, that if we truly try to live for the sake of something larger than ourselves. That you know, even how small the effort that it might be, if we can touch one person, two people, three people, a society, a community, a nation, a world, then truly the foundation for the substantial building of that world of world peace can be established. I believe that more and more young people should come 
and take on this challenge to bring the message of living for the sake of others, to bring the message of resuscitating the ideal of family, to bring the message of reconciliation, of understanding, and hope to the rest of the world. Thank you very much.
This afternoon, we have a simple but meaningful ceremony of friendship between our three delegations and many nations. 
Сейчас мы проведем очень простую, но очень значимую церемонию, чтобы подружиться, подружить все, все наши три страны. The simple goal is that the representatives of our three delegations can make a bond of friendship and commitment to work together for the peace of all humanity. Наша цель простая, чтобы представители трех делегаций подружились друг с другом, создали прочные узы ради всеобщего мира. We have 12 representatives from each delegation who will make a bond of friendship here on the stage. У нас есть по 12 человек от каждой делегации, которые создадут такие узы дружбы здесь на сцене. And for the rest of us, it's not specifically three, but please make friends with as many as possible. Now, as we shared this morning, even as we make these bonds of friendship, we also, everyone has a beautiful friendship certificate with a place for one person from each country to sign, yourself and the two other delegations.
Thank you very much. And now, congratulations to all of you. Please turn to the person on your right. Я очень признательна за то, что мне дали возможность высказать свое впечатление о тех конференциях, которые я посетила в американском Бриджпорте, в Пекине и вот здесь, в Москве. Это совершенно удивительные какие-то собрания людей, которые мечтают о дружбе, о любви, о вечной любви. Сегодня говорили, что это утопия, но человеку свойственны свойственно мечтать об этих утопических идеях, потому что без утопии, которая как звезда во лбу должна гореть, мы никогда не придем ни к какому соглашению. И поэтому то, что здесь собрались эти изумительные, удивительно нравственные, удивительно эмоциональные утописты, говорит о том, что мир наш еще не потерян. Мы его еще обретем, этот мир. Ну что я еще хотела сказать, что здесь собрались люди молодые, красивые, ну, со всех сторон чудесные, эмоциональные. Я думаю, что наша планета еще долго будет жить, когда такое удивительное движение, созданное господином Муном, набирает силу. Мне кажется, даже, вы знаете, это движение, я уже эту мысль высказывала в Пекине, может повернуть историю, повернуть историю в в сторону добра, в сторону любви, в сторону э, семьи крепкой, в сторону воспитания наших детей в духе э, любви и братства. Еще раз благодарю тех, кто дал мне возможность высказать все мое восхищение тем, что я видела на этих трех конференциях, название которых Lasting Club. Thank you.